little towns as part of like population growth or whatever were created all of them that have a like a Tigringa name all originate post 91 European calendar and obviously new settlements are new settlements because they didn't have a name before but any of the other ones they were all converted and other names are still recognized by people who live there like elders a lot of them like know they say like Betamulu and I, I remember that specifically because I couldn't find it on the map and I was like where's Betamulu they're like oh my gaba <laughs> and I'm like but it's, <laughs> why doesn't it say Betamulu they're like because that's how the people of Wolgait remember it those who are still living and remember you understand and part of one of the main things that they did when they when the TPLF first comes into this area, it's a, it's a good 10 years prior to 91, the early 80s, is when they first emerge into that area. And they started the cleansing process way before they took government control, because that's one of the, the main places when they were fighting the dirt that they were in and out of. And there's, you know, people who remember distinctly some people that we've talked to and interviewed who remember, you know, how they were trying to convert people, bring people to their side to fight, you know, the, the government and all of that kind of stuff. But even in that time, their initial target of people they were killing were male elders, historians, landowners, and, you know, like respected people who couldn't teach, who remembered history you know, who had a lot of oral history or respected in the community and such. They eliminated the majority of those people before 91. Literally before they were sitting. So sometimes it's like, it's not just three decades, it's four decades of cleansing and elimination that happened. And it was very systematic and very, very intentional. They cleared elders and they, they made sure prominent land-owning people especially men, specifically men, were eliminated. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was just part of their process. And they changed names of places. They even changed monuments. Names of monuments. And I, I mean, I'll find the detail, but they, they changed specific places. And how you know is, you know how it is with most, most communities in Ethiopia, um, in different provinces, there's a lot of oral history. There's a lot of people who tell you about places and they you know, and they speak about all oh, my grandparents and, and all this kind of stuff. They, they name things and time, pl time frames and episodes and events in history. And the way they tell it, you know, you'll find these like, wait, where's that? And you're like, oh, it's called this now because it's been transferred. It's been converted. Students couldn't go to, um, parents couldn't send their children to school if they didn't have the correct type of names. Um, in the Tigray region, um, Irop, Kurama, and Tigringa were languages that were allowed. Amharic was prohibited. I find that very fascinating. Very fascinating. So the Irop community within the northern parts of what we know as Tigray region today and others, their languages were not prohibited. The Elimination of the Amharic language out of the recognition of the regional state of Tigray as it was formed, which incorporated Walkait as quote unquote Western Tigray, had a predominant Amharic speaking people and they were not allowed to speak the language. People who didn't speak Tigringa and only spoke Amharic were initial and utmost targets of elimination. Yes. Another, you know, proof of ethnic cleansing. And this happened through time. People who were bilingual had a better chance of survival because they could employ their Tigringa um, skills for survival. Um, there's records of people who changed their names of their children, like Haile to Hailum, <laughs> and things like this, so they could attend school because they would be rejected. They couldn't register their students to go to public school and get an education. If you don't have an ID that had a Tigringa name, right, in the hospitals, they wouldn't give you an identification card. This is part of record. It was a mar You couldn't go into a hospital and get treatment with a name that didn't have 
at a gringa uh, conversion to it. So people for survival also change their name and change their children's name. That's that's I mean it's like it's 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 mind blowing, actually. Regarding Welkite, there's one uh, specific issue, especially from the perspective of the international community and different um, institutes referring to Welkite and that general area as Western Tigray. We, I believe, should uh, provide context mm -hmm. in order to uh, shed light on the reality um, of, first of all, the historical perspective and also the, say generally, uh, ethnic cleansing that's been happening in the area. First of all, in history, prior to the uh, advent or uh, coming to power of TPLF, mm -hmm. we had provinces in Ethiopia, right? Right. So we had 14 provinces, one of which was Tigray. Tigray was not a state per se, it was a province. So that's uh, prior to the Dirk and during the Dirk. Uh, the Dirk was the communist uh, regime that ruled for 17 years before TPLF came to power. So during the time of uh, Emperor Haile Selassie and even prior to that, when Ethiopia was um, a monarchy uh, and during the Dirk, the 14 provinces um, had existed for a while and even prior to that, uh, maybe even a century prior to the time of Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, still had provinces, but there were uh, different creations of provinces. But Tigray remained a province uh, throughout that time. And what's very important to highlight here is that the geographic composition and um, um, existence of the province of Tigray and what became the state of Tigray after the advent of TPLF are very different. So focusing on the province, the province of Tigray, especially in the eastern part of it, was what later became part of Afar, which is a different state. Uh, in the uh, ethnic federal, quote unquote, arrangement, contextually, the ethnic uh, states that were created mm. were nine. There's like nine of them. Nine no, regions. Nine regions, nine right? Ethnic yeah. regions. Right. Eth yeah, ethnic region states right. that are semi autonomous. But what was Eastern Tigray right. became Northern Afar. And the state literally, uh, upon its creation, migrated. I mean, so geographically, uh, when we um, look at the, the area, the eastern part of Tigray mm. was not of specific interest uh, to TPLF in, uh, say, the process of the creation of the state of Tigray. They viewed that part, the geographic part of Tigray as not necessary mm. to maintain and it would uh, if you analyze that, it would actually validate the, say, incorporation of the Western part of that state in our time, which was never part of the Tigrayan province. Mm. So... Historically part of the government. Exactly. So the Western part that was incorporated in the Tigrayan state in our time was not part of the province of Tigray. The original province. Exactly. In history. Right. So 
the state upon its creation, the state of Tagai upon its creation, geographically migrated to the west. And not only that, but also to the south. By cutting off parts of the east and taking or additional parts in the west. Yeah. So getting rid of its eastern part right. and allocating that to Afar in the creation of the Afar state as a region. Mm -hmm. That was a good excuse, so to speak, to incorporate the western part of what is included in the state of Tigray upon its creation, mm -hmm. post or after the dissolution of the provinces. So this is the point. What is today western Tigray was never part of the province of Tigray. It was part of northern Gonda. So you have Bagamadar. So Bagamadar was a province. And a, it was a province of mostly Amharic speakers, Amharas. And non-Amharas also lived there, the province in general. You had different um, ethnic groups that might have coexisted. For example, the Kamand people and like, you know, Tigrayans might have like come there to live and to also uh, do uh, business, uh, different activities farm. and farm or whatever, different things. But in terms of... But there's Tigrinya speaking people in that area as well as, right? Well, yeah, living there. Right. Yeah, but, uh, but it was never a Tigrayan province or a, a province or a region. Right. And that, that was also the point of provinces because provinces were not based on ethnicity, right? For example, there's no ethnicity called Bagimidr. No. There, there's no ethnicity called... It's a place. Yeah, it's the name of a province. Right. It's like the cantons in Switzerland, for example. Right. You have whatever many cantons, but then you have four uh, different ethnic groups and you can have like two or three ethnic groups coexisting in a canton. So it, it's kind of the same concept. Mm. So, Which is how provinces were before. Yeah. It was just places, and then you have, you know, mixed ethnicities, but then there's some ethnic group that was like dominant, mm. because that was their historical place for whatever, you know, in different places, in Shawa and different places. So yeah. Bagamidur is one of those. Yeah, well. As a province, Bagamidur is a province, Tigray is a province, mm -hmm. had its own dimensions, that's what you're saying. Sure, yeah. And what's interesting is that what makes the Tigrayan province peculiar, especially in that time, is that the province itself was named after an ethnic group, right? Right. Yeah. So that was used as a trick, so to speak, for uh, upon the creation of the Tigrayan state to claim <laughs> different uh, parts of that region is the property of uh, the ethnicity of uh, Tigrayans. Mm. So this needs to be understood. Mm. Well, um, in history, like t in, in total, it was not, it's never, it's not the only province that was named after an ethnic group. There was an Amhara province in, in the ancient, ancient mm -hmm. past mm -hmm. and in the medieval era or up until actually the um, uh, time of Emperor Johannes, right, the fourth, right, but you could you still had, for example, Amharas living outside of the Beta Amhara or Amhara province of the time. You had the core, you had the Amhara province, but then you also had Amharas living in different uh, provinces like Lasta, like Angot, and Bagamida for example, and Gojam yeah. and uh, Shaw, all these provinces, but then you had Beta Amhara in the southern uh, part of Wello and also the northern part of Shaw, actually. Right. So, now, what's interesting is the Welkite area, there's, there's a river there called Takazi. Mm -hmm. And it's always been perceived as the border between the Tigrayan province or the Tigrayan uh, land, right, proper, separating the Tigrayan province from 
Begimedr, or from the Gondorim uh, area. Mm -hmm. And what was the Welkite region at the time, uh, well, during the time of uh, the monarchy and also during the Derg, you had the Tigrayan province, you had the Welkite area, and then bordering the Welkite area, you had the uh, Eritrean land. Right. But then upon the creation of the state of Tigray, what happened was the eastern part of Tigray was given or allocated to arbitrarily and because that's how the the whole ethnic federal, so to speak, system was implemented. Let's be specific yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. Language was the basis for the creation of regions in 91 mm -hmm. when TPLF takes power, right? So, and then to what you said. So, Tigrinya speaking people, that didn't mean exclusively Tigrinya. It's very important to highlight, right? Mm -hmm. So, Amhara people of Bagdamadir, historical Gondar, Bagdamadir, right? In the northern part, who existed there. Um, a lot, especially, uh, here's the part I find very, very interesting. Specifically to the westernmost part of Bagdamadir is where you have the most Tigrinya speaking Amharas or indigenous people, Ethiopian people, call them whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But they spoke Amharinya um, and they speak Tigrinya. And that's the part that is most closest to Madribahari on one side. Takaze River has historically been cited in several references as that distinction between the land of Tigre, that's how they put it in like these white text, like, you know, textbooks. Um, I'm, I'm thinking of this author, but I can't remember right now, but, and then Amhara is put it at the, at the south of the Takaze. And then there's several references of this, poems, historical records, books, narratives, whatever, that, that cite the same thing. It's just a well-known thing. You said um, when the eastern part of what was historically Tigray province was basically given into or put into the region of Afar, right? And then the part of Bagamidir or the northern part of Gondar was then incorporated into this newly found region called Tigray region. It's like it shifted. Mm -hmm. And language was the pretext for this move. So if you were Tigrinya speaking, you were like incorporated, right? But they didn't have any, and, and the Afar um, part, is that because there's a Afaris who lived in the eastern part of that province? Is that kind of like the, in your understanding? Yes, I mean, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that they're not Tigrinya speaking. It doesn't mean they don't speak other languages, but literally using language as the <coughs> definition to determine somebody's identity. I feel like language is one part of your identity. But for instance, I'll use myself as an example. I don't speak Tigrinya, but by blood, I am Eritrean and I'm Ethiopian. And Ethiopian is in, I'm um, of a certain, you know, ethnic identity from my mom's side and then from my dad's side. But the fact that I don't speak Tigrinya would, with this context, not make me um, eligible to be Eritrean by their definition. True. Right? Yeah. That's basically what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But if I live in a place, right? and I speak a specific language, or maybe my dominant language, maybe I'm dual, I'm bilingual, all right? So the pretext they use to siphon off one and incorporate another is just, okay, if you speak this language, oh, and you have green grass land, you're part of Tigray now, and you know, it doesn't matter that you speak Amharinya or that's your base language, that's irrelevant at this point, because I'm gonna take this part, it makes sense, it has no hysterical bearing, but I'm taking this part, and then, oh, I know that my people historically have lived in this area that we call Afar now, but you know, you speak 
uh, a far off or whatever. <laughs> so um, it's, yeah, and you're just going to like cut it, cut this part and separate them. But you have people like Kunama and stuff that live on both sides of Tigray and Eritrea, and the Ago people who live on this side, and that's like you know the, a lot of people's languages and ethnic identities were definitely not part of this grand scheme. I find it very interesting. Exactly, and the, yeah, this mean, is you, also you separated people. You know, a yes. lot of Afar people, you know, they make a good point of saying that they're separated into three different regions. Actually, not even, not countries. Well, this is where it gets interesting. It, that's because the very makeup of uh, the way that the socio-political fabric of Ethiopia was constructed was, it was never based on ethnic identity. And that's, that's right. the reason. That's why you have different eth ethnic groups living, coexisting mm -hmm. in, in certain lands. Right. And when you impose um, a political arrangement that focuses on uh, the allocation of uh, or attribution of, um, well, ethnicity to land. So what happens is you inevitably strip away the right of existence of different ethnic groups exactly. so <laughs> and that's a problem and even for example what's really interesting about the Tigrayan province is that the name Tigray was uh, even etymo etymologically it was never a, a designation of an ethnic group <laughs> and that's why even even though we say that uh, the province of Tigray is the only province that actually designate, designate a, a certain ethnic group. If you really try to understand the term um, Tigray, it, just, it, it means trader, hmm. to trade, right? So, so the actual definition of the word Tigray yeah, is it, to it, trade? To trade. It, uh, Tigraya? The, uh, the etymology, even in Arabic. Hmm. Tajiro, the okay. same, yeah, the same etymological uh, term there. It, it means traders, and that's because of the Red Sea and like the trading uh, system that was ongoing for centuries with neighbors such as the Arabs mm. and uh, different uh, uh, entities mm. throughout history. So, <clears throat> but then it became descriptive of a certain ethnic group in the area. Uh, with a distinct language that grew out of uh, the Giz language right. uh, in ancient times. So, and upon the dissolution of the Aksumite Empire uh, and following that as an aftermath, that that's what happened. And that's why the, the name of the province, even though it actually became the designation of the ethnic group, um, the province itself did not necessarily mean that it it was the designation or, or like the, the the term itself meant that the land belonged to only a certain ethnic group right you see so because there were different several ethnic groups living there you have the Irob, you have you know or saho uh the kunama that you mentioned you have you know the ago people the ago also live in uh, eritrea like the bogos or bilan you know and different ethnic groups living in the area so um there's that and <coughs> so upon the creation of the state of Tigray, the eastern part, yes, the Afar people lived there. They were part of like the diversity of uh, ethnicity in the, in the province. But upon the creation of um, the ethnic regions, that area was um, cut away from the Tigrayan state, right? So now the Afar state, and the Afar people, what's interesting about the Afar people is that the Afar people also live outside of Ethiopia. You have Afaris uh, living in Djibouti mm -hmm. and in Eritrea. So that's what we call the Afar Triangle. Right. So, um, and then there's the Afar state, uh, ethnic region in Ethiopia upon the uh, implementation or um, advent of ethnic federalism, so to speak. Uh, so, when that happened though, so that eastern part is gone for the Tigrayan province, but it's no longer a province, it's a state now, it's uh, actually even semi-autonomous. But the western part was not part of Tigray. Mm. 
right. uh, historically it was not it was, part of the. It was yeah. not. Yeah. It was not. So Maybe when they. The Takazi was never cited as part of it. The problem with uh, the system to begin with is that when you say that like a, like the land only belongs to a certain ethnic group, what you're doing is you're you're telling other ethnic groups that live there that they they don't have any uh, mm, uh, land right. Right. or they can't live there right. or even if they do they have to change their identity or they have to conform to the dominance of a certain identity because that's identity politics right. uh, and that's what was imposed so as a result of that for the past several decades what happened was all the Amharas um, that lived in Welkite because it was not part of the Tigran province found themselves as uh, members of the Tigrayan regional state uh -huh. overnight. Right. And for several decades when TPLF was in power up, up, up until the war, the, uh, the, the war with, uh, between TPLF and uh, Prosperity Party led by B Abi Ahmed, what happened was for several decades all the Amharas that were living there were forced to change their identity or to to, to conform to not be able to actually be themselves mm -hmm. uh, and and to be displaced um, uh, to be cleansed ethnically for many decades right. that's what happened and then when the war happened mm -hmm. uh, in 2020 right November of 2020 immediately what what happened was a massacre of Amharas in that area and that's what we know as the Maikadra massacre um, the Amharas were targeted um, because of their identity and massacred you know, as a result. So what's interesting is that um, the reports that um, are completely, but actually very questionable in their intent. The Amharas were actually, the, for the Amhara Fanos, for example, and the Liu Hail or the regional force, who were involved in uh, the war were accused of committing ethnic cleansing mm -hmm. against uh, or on Tigrayans. Right. But contextually, what was never highlighted or never told, or, but especially uh, when it comes to international uh, media outlets, is that it's any um, kind of um, a violent engagement or interaction between the two groups that happened there was contextually, it was not Amharas trying to take over land that does not belong to them or that, that belongs to Tigrayans and ethnically cleansing Tigrayans. It was Amharas trying to reclaim land that was theirs and also uh, trying to um, defend their people who just suffered a, a massacre at Maikandra. Of approximately 1,600 people in a matter of two days. Exactly. That was, uh, yeah, and that was uh, a massacre of Amharas at the hands of Samri, uh, who are the Samri militia, the right? Samri militia who I'll are TPL. I'll tell you something interesting yeah. about Maikandra massacre because you know how it was claimed that it was Tigrayans that were killed in several news outlets, even Amnesty and stuff, and they took it back. They, they retracted some of that. But originally, and I think even CNN, major outlets reported it as the massacre of Tigrayans at, you know, at Maikadra. And here's why evidence and facts becomes a very, very significant thing. Um, Maikadra, during the times of, uh, the time of the Dug, right? The settlement starts during that time, in the late 70s, I believe, uh, 74, 75, something around there, in the 70s. And the way settlements happen, specifically in those provinces at the time, and even to this day, is you have kabbalis that are um, created, right? First, the buildings and the, the, the homes of the people for who are like day laborers and stuff, farming laborers and stuff. That's how the settlements start when the Derg settled people in these areas, that specific town. 
that specific area which was not settled that specific town area not not Bagamida, right speaking to that um Kabbalahs would be formed and it would be like Kabbalah 1 Kabbalah 2 Kabbalah 3 as populations grow um it's Kabbalah 1 being the first right Kabbalah 2 being the second so on and so forth facts are that number one of the 1600 people massacred at Maikadra, um, I think all but like 50 or 60 people are from Kabbalah 1. It's a very important fact. And they were all Amhara. Because the first people settled there were Amhara in Maikadra. The most Tigrayans in the Maikadra area, from a census information, were in Kabbalah's 4 and 5 which came after TPLF takes over and those were new settlements that were the result of people being settled from different parts of Tigray, some from Sudan and such. That's how these areas come to be. So one very factual way to disprove, besides the fact that, you know, people's names have recorded and, you know, it's known what their ethnicity was, um, is the fact that there was minimal attacks on any of the other Kabbalahs except Kabbalah 1, which was known to be settled by Amharas. It was targeted as an Amhara Kabbalah. You know, they don't talk about that enough, and I think it's very important to highlight that. Um, the, yes. vast ma yeah. mm. the vast majority of the people killed during the Maikadra massacre were from Kabbalah 1. The Kabbalah records show the people's names when they came. Some of the victims that I've even spoken to, survivors, were amongst the first, actually were the first settlers in my Kadra. Like Yitakoro Koro, like, you know, the place emerged out of that first Kabbalah and it grew into the, you know, when the farming, whatever, start, that community started growing, these people were Amara. And there are actually very, very few Tigrayans who lived amongst there. And those that lived there were either intermarried to Amharas or were in leadership somehow. They were like administrators and such, right? Very few in that Kabbalah, in Kabbalah 1, were of anything except Amhara um, uh, ethnicity. Others were daytime laborers who would be there seasonally and would rent rooms because they were Amhara and they would be forced to go and rent rooms in the Amhara Kabbalah because they weren't allowed to be in other areas. Like this is just like how that community existed for decades and is a known thing. So the fact that Samri militia um, and others studied that area and targeted that one Kabbalah in itself is proof that the target were Amharas. It was also the most, if I, if I may be wrong on this, but it was the most heavily populated Kabbalah as well, as well in yeah. my cadre. so this yeah this is um, yeah it's uh, unbelievable actually as a fact uh, to consider um, yeah, and many things were done uh, especially trying to portray that anything that uh, once you label the area as Western Tigray that any massacre that happens there could be misconstrued and uh, presented falsely as a massacre on Tigrayans. Right, because that, the that place is labeled as ex Exactly, that. that's what mm -hmm. happened. The place is labeled as Western Tigray, a massacre happened uh, targeting Amharas and then internationally it was portrayed as a massacre of Tigrayans. That's what happened. Right. And that needs to be exposed and understood. It needs to be understood. Exactly. It's been exposed. But I think even Tigrayans need to understand that. Well, yeah. Uh, I mean, mostly Tigrayans <coughs> need to understand that. Mm -hmm. Why? Western Tigray. Western never, Tigray. Never existed as a term, as a name of a place. The coinage. Arab Tigray. The Western coinage. Tigray, where does that come from? That's something that needs to be actually thoroughly investigated because, first of all, who came up with the uh, with that term? Or there's no uh, historical record. Yeah, there's no such thing as Western Tigray. Uh, there's Tigray, um, there was Tigray as a province, right. now 
um, there's uh, Tigray as a regional state, ethnic state, and the western part of it was never Tigray <laughs> to begin with. No, I think that's yeah. very important. The, the, the name Western Tigray was coined in the 90s. There's no historical record that says Western Tigray, to my knowledge. There is none. Or Western Tigray, when Tigray was a province, is what is now Central Tigray. So Central Tigray was Western Tigray oh, in the because past. because of the shift with, yeah. you know, parts of province of Tigray being exactly. put into a far region. Geographically, it was actually pushed over shifted. to the West. Yeah, it was pushed over to the West. It was, um, it literally changed its geographical, it, it, it changed in, in shape entirely. The entire shape of Tigray was changed. And it's not only Welkites, it's very important here to mention that even the south of the northern part of Wello, parts of northern Wello mm -hmm. were incorporated in, into uh, Tigray, the southern parts of Tigray. For example, Koram, Raya, uh, Waja, and all those areas. Mm -hmm. That was not uh, part of the Tigrayan state. Right. So that needs to be uh, highlighted. And Whenever um, international media or any group that references to uh, Western, to, that actually use the term Western Tigray, needs to understand is that they're actually not talking about Tigray. Right. When they when they when they say Western Tigray, they're they're actually imposing forcefully and violently imposing an identity on people that don't identify with that um, ethnic identity. So that in itself is a violation. It's an assault. It's a psychological attack. And physically, uh, these people have been experiencing ethnic cleansing in there for a long time. Mm -hmm. So for decades. You know what's interesting about the whole terminology about Western Tigray is a lot of the places in quote unquote what was coined as Western Tigray, which we know to be Bulkait Tagare, part of Bagamadur, Northern Gondar, right? Is that these changes of names or new definitions came about as a part of a process. And it's again factually recorded because. Cities, provinces, towns, kabbalahs recorded the beginning of these terms and the renaming of places. And I'm going to read some from the, the research team in Gondar that did all this um, work around the genocide of people and ethnic cleansing in, um, in uh, Wolkait. So TPLF changed many places to have Tigringa meanings in Tagade Warada as well. Right? This is one example. Addis Alam was changed to Adi Salam. Okay, that was happened in 86, right? And this is an um, 86 meaning Amharic um, calendar, 86. So this is roughly 93. Hilab to Alam Gannet. Uh, Shumari to Tabia Salam. Wainet to Division. Ambagella to Hafarom Maicho. Hagari Mariam to Fandika. Um, and so on and so on. There's you know, there's some interesting one actually, some that was like Beta Mulu, for, for instance, and I went there. Beta Mulu was changed to My Gaba in 76. Um, again, 83 in the European calendar. Uh, but my to My Like These things happened through time, through these decades that we're talking about. And then new provinces, or not provinces, sorry, like new what it does or like little towns as part of like population growth or whatever were created. All of them that have a, like a Tigringa name all originate post 91 European calendar. And obviously new settlements are new settlements because they didn't have a name before. But any of the other ones, they were all converted and other names are still recognized by people who live there, like elders. A lot of them like know, they say like Betamulu. I, and I, I remember that specifically because 
I couldn't find it on the map. And I was like, well, here's Betamuru. They're like, oh, my gaba. <laughs> and I'm like, but <laughs> why doesn't it say Betamuru? They're like, because that's how the people of Wolgait remember it. Those who are still living and remember, you understand? And part of one of the main things that they did when, they, when the TPLF first comes into this area, it's a, it's a good 10 years prior to 91, the early 80s is when they first emerge into that area. And they started the cleansing process way before they took government control because that's one of the, the main places when they were fighting the dead that they were in and out of. And there's, you know, people who remember distinctly some people that we've talked to and interviewed who remember, you know, how they were trying to convert people, bring people to their side to fight, you know, the, the government and all of that kind of stuff. But even in that time, their initial target of people they were killing were male elders, historians, landowners, and, you know, like respected people who couldn't teach, who remembered history. You know, who had a lot of oral history or respected in the community and such. They eliminated the majority of those people before 91. Literally before they were sitting. So sometimes it's like, it's not just three decades, it's four decades of cleansing and elimination that happened. And it was very systematic and very, very intentional. They cleared elders and they, they made sure prominent land-owning people especially men, specifically men, were eliminated. Yeah, right, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was just part of their process. And they changed names of places. They even changed monuments. Names of monuments. And I mean, I'll find the detail, but they, f they changed specific places. And how you know is, you know how it is with most, most communities in Ethiopia, um, in different provinces, there's a lot of oral history. There's a lot of people who tell you about places and they you know, and they speak about all oh, my grandparents and, and all this kind of stuff. They, they name things and time, pl time frames and episodes and events in history. And the way they tell it, you know, you'll find these like, wait, where's that? And you're like, oh, it's called this now because it's been transferred. It's been converted. Students couldn't go to... Um, parents could send their children to school if they didn't have the correct type of names. Um, in the Tigray region, um, Irop, Kurama, and Tigringa were languages that were allowed. Amharic was prohibited. I find that very fascinating. Very fascinating. So the Irop community within the northern parts of what we know as Tigray region today and others their languages were not prohibited. The elimination of the Amharic language out of the recognition of the regional state of Tigray as it was formed, which incorporated Walkait as quote unquote Western Tigray, had a predominant Amharic speaking people and they were not allowed to speak the language. People who didn't speak Tigringa and only spoke Amharic were initial and utmost targets of elimination. Yes another, you know, proof of ethnic cleansing. And this happened through time. People who were bilingual had a better chance of survival because they could employ their Tigringa um, skills for survival. Um, there's records of people who changed the names of their children, like Haile to Hailom, <laughs> and things like this, so they could attend school because they would be rejected. They couldn't register their students to go to public school and get an education. If you don't have an ID that had a Tigringa name, right, in the hospitals, they wouldn't give you an identification card. This is part of record. It was a mark. You couldn't go into a hospital and get treatment with a name that didn't have a Tigringa uh, conversion to it. So people for survival also changed their name and changed their children's name. That's, that's, I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's mind blowing, actually. There's people who've told me their names in talking and they're like, well, my mother calls me this at home, but my ID says this because, and this, this is the reason why. So the levels of, ethnic discrimination 
and systematic like processes used to eliminate, push out, disappear, people, history, identity, language. I mean, these are all the mechanisms of genocide. All of them. Absolutely. All of them. Yeah. And it's, it's actually extremely, extremely, extremely tragic how this happened. Because this happened while the region that governed was intentionally executing these things. But the federal government was them, the TPLF. And then on top of that, the constitution or the law of the land was literally designed to enable this. So these people had no avenues of getting any, you know, any change, any justice, any, nothing. So their choice was to survive, leave. And those who could did. And by, in, in the course of, you know, what, the three decades, it's, a, it, to me, a miracle that Amhara people still existed in that place. It's the sheer will to survive that people who even concealed and didn't speak their native tongue, like literally spoke it only at home and wouldn't speak it out in public because that was a, that was a, something that would get you executed. People would get arrested and put into death holes for listening to Amharic music. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's true. Just listening to music. Um, one of the victims that I spoke to was arrested for a year and four months because they found an, a cassette tape in his home that had a Marina music. That was, his, that was his crime. You know? So, and these people that survived to tell the stories are the strongest of the strongest. Because the majority are not around to tell their story. I don't think there's even an actual number that quantifies how many people were actually eliminated. Because it's four decades. Four decades of elimination. And the children of a lot of these people scattered everywhere around the world. Yes. In Sudan, in Australia, parts of Europe, in America. They're displaced, yeah. Displaced completely. And if you... If, if we did a tally, not just a tally, but like interviews and conversation with like even a segment of these people and they start telling their stories of what they knew about their parents, their grandparents um, and told these stories, I think the numbers are astronomical. So that's why it's so interesting to me that the Western world, <laughs> mainstream media and all the agencies that are complicit with this re-narration of this really have the audacity to claim that there was an ethnic cleansing of Tigrans. It's fascinating. Very fascinating. It's fascinating because none of these other things are even given a this much time. Of, yeah. Yeah. Not even the slightest consideration. Yeah. I mean, every time you start reading some of these things, and they're all evidence-based. They're not like, oh, hearsay. They're not. There's records, records of people from Kabbalahs, from townships. There's certificates. There's landowner, like, like um, blueprints with names of places and people, all of which were like changed, converted, but they still exist. And they're only, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And, and of course, there's records all the way back. But all of these things are there hospital records even like you know in the the health aspect there's like by law there's um in ethiopian constitutional law with three thousand to five thousand people i think it is you have to have certain like type of medical facilities available to people as part of as part of you know legal rights human rights um provisions right so you can have like a medical center, a medical um, complex, or whatever they call it, like small medical centers or like that serve 3,000 to 5,000 community. Um, and then a 
major health plex or whatever it is is for a community of 10 to 15,000, so on and so forth. I'm not being very exact, but it's basically designed by size of population. What the government has an obligation to provide, right? Predominantly Amhara speak, Amhara, Amhara people or Amharic speaking communities, right? With large populations, like Tegede is one of the examples, um, had the minimal medical facilities available where places like division where it was majority to grand people living there had less population right under 10,000 but had the major facilities right and here's why it's a problem why not go to the you know major facility if you had a certain need and of course it, it matters your health condition what you can be provided for depends on the type of facility it's basically our equivalent of urgent care versus a hospital, right? So they couldn't go into division for treatment because their IDs would disqualify them from getting treatment. That's one. Another is there's mass records of people who would end up in these health facilities and never come out. They go with, you know, some sort of ailment and they leave poisoned or dead. And there's tons of these records. There's actually a Tigrayan woman who, you know, from Makale, who was a health provider, health uh, professional, who was interviewed by Gondor University, that details how many protests she made about this stuff, because she's like, there's distinct, like, discrimination of Amharas who are ending up dead, poisoned. There was a poisoning mechanism. As soon as they see, and these were medical professionals who were complicit in doing this. So because this was a well-known thing, people would not go to the places where they could get medical um, attention for what they need. So they end up going, if they can, to Gondar City, like the capital city or whatever, into the way south into, to get treatment, if they could, and end up staying somewhere else because this was another way of ensuring people would just leave because they had no provisions. So there is cleansing done in so many systematic ways. Education, you couldn't buy land or own land. You couldn't, be, you couldn't work in certain capacities. You couldn't send your kids to school. You couldn't listen to your own music. You couldn't speak your language. You couldn't retain your name. And if you defied, you would die. So I, I, I don't know how else, you know, you can qualify this or, you know, explain what's been happening, what's still not talked about, what's still not given recognition. And it's, 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 an, it's the audacity. That's how I see it. The audacity yeah. Of, yeah. of burying this and making this counterclaim. And I'm not saying that it's right for anybody to suffer. Like, you shouldn't be killed or ousted because you're Tigrayan, either. I'm, I completely denounce that. I agree. Completely denounce mm -hmm. that. But facts are facts. Facts are facts. My cadre that you explained earlier, very important example. Systematically targeted. Record shows that that's specifically an Amhara dominant settlement. Kabale one. And that was the target. It completely disproves Nima al Bajar and all of these people's like narrative of all these people that were. And that's one of the major examples used to cite this ethnic cleansing and massacre of Tigrayans in Walkait, or quote unquote, the new, newly coined Western Tigray is off three decades ago when all of this mess um, started. So it's fascinating but it's part of historical record that has to be explained over and over and over and over again until somebody wants to actually pay attention.